All right, let's do a hand physical exam. We should go nerve by nerve, and then we can also summarize some other maneuvers that you can do for specific suspected diagnoses. I think it's easier just to go nerve by nerve because then you can also review the musculature. So let's start off with the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve is protected by the FCU, flexor carpi ulnaris. It'll come through Guyen's canal and then give off a superficial sensory branch. So the superficial sensory branch gets the small finger and the ulnar half of the ring. So you can see here the branches. And you test that with your two-point discriminator, five millimeters, you can also use a paper clip. Make sure you do it in line with the neurovascular bundle and you ask the patient if they can feel one poke or two pokes. And you do that for each side of every finger. So again, here's the ulnar sensory. And then the deep branch, which is the deep motor branch, will go deep in the hand, get all of the hypothenar musculature. So test the hypothenars, ask the patient to push out with their small finger. You test abductor digiti minimi, have them oppose like this. You can feel opponents uh, digiti minimi, and then have them flex, and you can feel flexor digiti minimi firing. So that's a good way to evaluate the hypothenar, which is innervated by the motor branch of the ulnar. Additionally, the uh, deep motor branch will get the inner ossei, the palmar and dorsal. So you have the patient fight against you, trying to push their fingers apart. Great. And then have them spread and pinch like this and pinch your fingers. You can feel that the inner ossei are strong. If you want to do a quick test, you can just look for the first dorsal inner osseus, which is right here and have them fight against you to push out the index, and you can feel the first dorsal interosseous firing. That's the most distally innervated muscle of the ulnar nerve. It's a quick and dirty test to do for ulnar nerve compression or suspected ulnar nerve injury. Because if the distal most muscle is involved, then you know everything proximal must be involved too. All right, so we did the ulnar nerve. Now we switch over to the uh, median nerve. And also don't forget that the ulnar nerve innervates the flexor digitorum profundus to the small finger and to the ring finger, but the median nerve innervates FDP to the long finger and the index. So the median nerve travels through the carpal tunnel along with the flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, and the flexor pollicis longus tendons. The recurrent branch recurs and it innervates the thenar musculature. The most important muscle is abductor pollicis brevis. The quick and dirty test is to have the patient try to lift the thumb out of the plane of the table and feel APB firing. For carpal tunnel syndrome, that's an easy test to do to make sure that there's uh, adequate firing or innervation of that muscle. Additionally, you can do certain maneuvers such as tenelis, which is a nerve percussion test right at the carpal tunnel. And if they have paresthesias and tingling to that test, then you uh, have a likely suspicion of carpal tunnel. Additionally, you can compress the carpal tunnel. This is sometimes called Durkin compression test where you have to hold compression or you can have them do phalans when they flex their wrists and hold this for 30 to 60 seconds which will induce those tingling and paresthesias in the median nerve distribution. So the median nerve distribution again is the radial half of the ring finger, the long finger, index, thumb. So carpal tunnel syndrome will involve the radial half of the ring and the other fingers. If there's involvement of these fingers, then you need to suspect ulnar nerve compression syndrome at the elbow or potentially at Guyen's canal. Uh, alternatively, the uh, thenar musculature, you can also test, um, if you flip over, the thumb has, uh, uh, the, on the extensor side, you can test um, the radially innervated musculature to the thumb by having the patient lift the thumb out of the plane of the table, and that ex tests extensor pollicis longus. So for the radial nerve, remember, it gets it comes off the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, it gets all the posterior things on the forearm. All the extensors are posterior, posterior cord makes sense. So you can also have the patient hold the finger and then try to fight against you and you can feel extensor pollicis longus because it inserts on the base of the distal phalanx. Also extensor pollicis brevis extends on the base of the proximal phalanx. It's brevis, more short muscle and shorter tendon, therefore it doesn't go as far as the longus. It makes sense that it inserts on the base. And you can have the patient also fight by pushing here. And you can block EPL from, from, help, from allowing the help by blocking it down. Okay. The uh, other muscle in the first dorsal compartment, along with EPB, is abductor pollicis longus. And that inserts at the base of the metacarpal. So you can try to have the patient push against you at the base of the metacarpal. Um, so that's the first dorsal compartment. The second dorsal compartment 
extensor carpi radialis brevis. The third is extensor carpi radialis longus. They inserted the base of the second and third metacarpals. You can have the patient extend against you and you can feel that the extension force is intact. So the ECRB and ECRL are intact. The extensor digitorum communis to the fingers. You can see there's junctury tendinae that can fool you. For example, if there's a laceration here in this tendon is cut, this juncture will help pull this finger out of the in, out of um, the plane of the table into extension, so don't be tricked. To test EDC, you can have the patient try to extend every single finger individually or all together. Don't forget that extensor indices and extensor digiti minimi are individual extensors. They have their um, own extensors for the index and the small finger because they're particularly important. You can have the patient do a hook'em horn sign like this, and you can see that. They have individual muscle bellies so that they can function individually, as opposed to trying to have a patient extend just the ring finger on their own, it's hard to do because it's not an individual muscle belly. Uh, also on the extensor surface, you can see the extensor retinaculum, your extensor zones, remember extensor zone one is over the DIP, so one, three, five, seven. Extensor zone seven is where the extensor retinaculum is. Uh, the radial nerve will send a superficial branch about four to five centimeters proximal to the radial styloid, and it'll run to innervate the dorsal aspects of the index and the thumb. Uh, if we go back to start to look at our vasculature, you need to palpate the ulnar artery, palpate the radial artery, note how the radial artery sends a branch deep that goes through the uh, underneath or through the thenar musculature, and it has, this is the radialis indices or the radial contribution to the radial side of the index finger and it also has a volar supply to the thumb. The thumb has a volar and a dorsal blood supply. Additionally you need to test some of the other flexors of the wrist so you can have the patient try to fight against you with ulnar deviation and you can palpate flexor carpial naris. Similarly you can have the patient try to flex radially and you can feel FCR and then you, if they have the patient do a spider-man sign and you have them fight against you and you can see palmaris longus right there but that's not a very important tendon for your exam you don't even have to repair it another helpful tool is a pulse oximeter put it on each finger particularly if you're suspecting a vascular injury and document the number for each one so you can see if there's any sort of vascular compromise for each digit so we've tested the extensors we've tested the uh, volar surface and that's a comprehensive hand exam.